I'm talking about is very important for all our lives and has implications for your work. I'm talking about responsible innovation and ethics in engineering. No doubt we are living in a new age, a digital age, determined by big data. Within just one minute, we are sending 700 Google queries, 500,000 Facebook posts, and whatever we do, it leaves digital traces that are being collected. And people say data is the new oil. Obviously, it's possible to make a lot of money on data. But the question is, what are the ethical implications? So here we can see it quite clearly. Before, oil companies were the richest in the world, but now it's IT companies. Yeah. The side effect is that this big data that is being collected is collected about us. Not only, but we're in the focus on those who collect data. So we have you covered, says Axon Global, the favorite company of Homeland Security. And if you look up the web page, then you will find that there is screening 64,000 social media platforms. Facebook and Twitter are just two of them, 64,000. So whatever you do on the web, you know, is being recorded. And you could get a cybersecurity assessment of your company, but you wouldn't have to hand over your password to them in order to do that. Um, they can do it like this. So basically, I would come to their most likely already in your computers. Now the question is, uh, certainly big data can be used for a lot of good things, but does more data always mean more knowledge? And the answer is no. The more data, the more pattern will be in the data just by accident. There will be random patterns and that implies queries correlations, and those patterns could be very misleading. There's something that you often forget if you think the more data, the better, which is overfitting. And it means you would pay attention to random patterns, such as this one. Number of serial killers as a function of chocolate consumption. Yeah, if, if that was right, then basically it would be very dangerous to live in Switzerland, right? Well, yeah, I'm still alive, so it seems to be okay. Um, Google's Blue Trend used to be one of the prime examples of big data analytics success stories, but now they have taken it off the web because it doesn't work anymore. And similar things have happened, for example, with those genetic kids, 23 and me, you send in a probe, will get a letter telling you what are the likely diseases you'll get, what might be the cause of your death. And why was that taken off the market for some time? Do you have any idea? Well, if you would send another probe to another company and a third probe to a third company, you would get different letters sensitivity to the data, to the algorithms used. So you will always get an outcome and you tend to believe what the algorithm says, but you know, it could not be accurate in many cases. So therefore people say, oh, maybe we should leave this to artificial intelligence. Maybe people are just too stupid and now we will have AI systems that can access things much better than we can. And in fact, people say in about 20 years from now, we'll have computer systems more intelligent than humans. Some people say 40 years. Some people think maybe we have that already somewhere you know, in the military, sellers, whatever. For sure, we have computers that play better chess than humans. Where we have Robots that work better than humans, more precise, they don't get tired, they don't complain, they don't take holidays, they don't have to pay taxes, you know, so uh, it's attractive, of course, to companies.
companies. Um, we might soon have better drivers, algorithms, driving cars, self-driving cars, better diagnosis, better doctors, in other words, better in answering questions, at least those questions that have been answered already. And the robots become more and more capable and sophisticated. Of course, they could also build other robots. And now we have code that is self-coding. Uh, in principle, they could build better robots. And everything the robots learn could go into a robot Wikipedia. And that means any robot could learn that stuff in a split second, basically. So th these are your competitors. Um, and, and Google thinks now this is going to solve all the problems of the world. Now we have an AI system that not only beat the best Go player in the world, but we have even an AI system that learns by itself. We don't have to teach it to play Go. But the point is, maybe the problems of the world are not related to lack of intelligence, but lack of power. Do people vote the most intelligent people to be in power? Do they like them most? Usually not, right? So it's really this imbalance in power that uh, might be the problem and not lack of intelligence. In any way, in many cases, we don't understand how AI comes to its conclusion. So it's basically a black box and uh, that implies serious issues because these AI systems could also fall prey to the spurious correlations and to those random patterns that are in the data. Now, just recently a Google manager said, uh, forget killer robots, bias is the real AI danger. Not sure that makes you sleep better if there's something even more dangerous than killer bots. So what kind of bias? Well, these algorithms might discriminate people of color, minorities, women, and even though it's being claimed that those AI systems wouldn't have the weaknesses of humans, like being subjective and emotional, egotistic, and all these kind of things. So it's being claimed that those systems would be objective and uh, would always take the better decisions. It turns out that they also pay all prey to manipulation. Mm -hmm. So for example, this Microsoft bot, Ty, it was turned into a Nazi propaganda machine within just a day. And these things happen also to Google. You know, Google is learning, it's adapting to search patterns and all sorts of things. It's also manipulated by people who pay for advertisement. And that can create biases. In this case, rising biases, here is an example that happened before the election in Germany. So the date of the election 2017, that was the search. And what you get is propaganda against the CDU. Mm -hmm. So obviously there's bias. These machines can be manipulated and they are being manipulated. And that's exactly why they have this Russia probe at the moment and senators blast Facebook, Twitter, Google, because they have basically been used as propaganda machines for other countries, for other forces. Now in the meantime, people are going even a step further, They're not just optimizing the driving of cars and uh, the production in a factory, they're trying to automate cities. That's basically what's behind the smart cities concept. So you would distribute a lot of internet of things, sensors everywhere and then you know, from garbage to collection to uh, supply chains, everything would be automated. Uh, that's the vision of paradise that they have. But recently criticism comes up 
uh, in connection, for example, with this Google Smart City concept. So this article, for example, says it's the conser conservative newspaper um, has read a lot. So this is a digital nightmare, it is saying. And um, the point is they're basically turning a city into a fully surveilled prison for citizens. You know, that, that's what this author concludes from the concept that Google has developed. So in fact, if you automate the city, it will turn it into a totalitarian system to some extent. If you don't ask people anymore, they have to do what the system tells them, right? Now, interestingly enough, if you look into the hit rate of the most livable cities in the world, then those cities are not located in the leading IT nations, which all the time claim to build paradise on Earth, but apparently they don't know what makes a paradise, right? These are cities that are offering opportunities to many different kinds of people, different nationalities, the different religions, different minorities, so kind of creating places to unfold your ideas and talents. That is what matters to turn a city into a paradise, participatory opportunity, right? And in fact, I had the privilege of participating in this Wilson Park meeting where representative of smart cities around the world and of the companies building those technologies and of institutions including Homeland Security with evaluating the success of those smart city concepts and the conclusion was it did work. Nobody was really satisfied with the outcome. And effectively make an analysis whether a benevolent dictatorship uh, as it's sometimes promoted by these kind of people. You know, if, if you just have enough data, data will tell you the truth, and then you just have to do what the data tells you. That's kind of what they call the benevolent dictatorship. Um, this doesn't work. You know. So you can see, for example, Hungary, which may consider itself a little bit in this tra tradition, started as the leading country in economic affairs and it ended last. And we did an analysis for all the countries around the world based on data and turns out that democracy is not a luxury but is actually uh, promoting prosperity. Now you sometimes hear Elon Musk uh, warning of AI. He says it might be the biggest existential threat to humanity. Don't get me wrong, you know, I, I don't <coughs> say big data is bad, AI is bad. On the contrary, I, I really think we should use it, but we should use it well. And in order to use it well, it's important that we see the potential risks and downsides and unwanted side effects and all these kind of things. And if you develop technology, you always should also think about how can it be misused? What is the dual use potential? Because you might have the very best intentions, but anybody could take your knowledge and use it for something else. You know, have you thought about this? And we'll look into these kind of things. So he says, basically, humans will have difficulties to keep up with robots, and that's why we need to build brain chips. And so the question is, who of you would want to have a brain implant? Come on, you're engineers. Uh, one, two, three. Uh, Twenty percent discount today. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> so <laughs> Keep on <the> list, uh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this, these are already the cyborgs, I guess. Would you, would you like to get advertisements to your brain by accident? <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. People have been asked, uh, how much uh, would you? want to get in exchange for all the data about what you're thinking and also for uh, companies to be able to influence your thinking and they said about 10,000 Swiss fr francs per month. 
Okay, but anyway, th this is already being tested, uh, brain chips, you know, and uh, cyborg technology kind of upgrading people with technology. And some people say maybe we should instead upgrade people biologically, genetically. Uh, there are also all sorts of experiments going on already in the world. So designer babies, in other words, and this will be your future competitors, perhaps. Um, but here is an issue: it becomes so simple to manipulate genes that this is actually a great threat. So I think it was Clapper, a CIA chief, who said that gene editing could be turned into a weapon of mass destruction. You just suppose somebody was able to edit your genes without even asking you to expose you to some kinds of um, molecules that would change your genes. And it could be governments or terrorists or whoever who is doing these kind of things. You know, the military has actually already tested biological weapons and even on their own population. And so now suppose you would um, be exposed to nanoparticles or nanobots. You know, nanobots, of course, can be used for good, so it can be used uh, to eliminate cancer, people think. But it uh, can be also used to produce cancer. Kind of a, a dual use scenario, obviously. And it's very difficult to protect yourself from nanoparticles, right? It could be in water, it could be in the air. So, in fact, our exposure to nanoparticles like diesel fumes, um, they have an impact on our health and they kill a lot of people early on. That could be used for chemical warfare. Now, you wouldn't even see it. You wouldn't even know it. And then that could be even an interaction of these nanoparticles with electrical radiation, right? So assume your body is accumulating these particles over time, but you don't notice any effect, but suppose they're magnetic particles and you're exposed to electromagnetic uh, a magnetic field and that's going to do something to your body. And in fact, it's also possible to now create directed energy weapons with that technology that's being used for telecommunication. So it just needs an algorithm to direct it to a certain kind of place and will have an impact on that place. It could be you or your brain. It doesn't have to happen, but what I'm trying to say is we need to watch much more carefully of what is being done with the kind of technology that scientists and engineers develop. And as long as there are wars out in the world, societies will be vulnerable to these kind of things, right? So it's, it's more urgent than ever to develop peace on Earth, to be, to make sure that these kind of technologies will be used well. Same thing with geoengineering, might be good to, to improve climate, but could also be used to create maybe tornadoes or so. Some people think it now, why do we need to be concerned? Because a lot of research money actually is channeled into research through military sources. It's an industrial military complex. A lot of research in the United States come funded by DOD, Homeland Security, and so on. So why are they doing it? Of course, in principle, they have in mind to use it as weapons or self-defense. And so the first thing that's being developed is kind of the dual use. And then eventually, over time, you know, it's, it's being monetized 
through businesses and later on it will be in the public domain. So there might be much more dual use around than you imagine and given the enormous amounts of money that are put into military research, a lot of bad things could happen. And in order to give you a little bit of idea of what might happen in a very entertaining way, we've written this science fiction I got. So I'd like to recommend you to read it because it's basically uh, demonstrating how our society could develop, where we might be heading, and where are the dangers, and where we need to watch out and pay attention. Now, what, what is now happening is basically a convergence of all sorts of technology, like computer technology, communication technology, high frequency technology, software technology is being integrated into pervasive computing, and then artificial intelligence and brain research and neuroscience basically creates a cognitive science and cognitive computing. And then biology, biotechnology comes in. And in the end, process engineering and molecular design and all of that somehow is thought to be converging. And each of these technologies has, of course, potential side effects. And the combination of them even more so. So one of the side effects is that it's possible to hack our thinking, our emotions, our behavior. So we have brains that run on 100 watts, not more than an electrical bulb. It's just amazing what our brain does with so little energy. But it takes shortcuts. It simplifies certain kind of tasks. And so we have cognitive biases, quite a few of them. And these cognitive biases can be used against you to trick you, to manipulate you. And they have been collected. And Secret Services have been looking into the question, of how can we use that actually to manipulate subjects? Like terrorists, governments, people who should protect uh, computer systems, system administrators, you know, how can we manipulate them, for example, to accidentally download a train your horse to the computer? So these are the tricks, you know, about 50 of them. Most likely there are 30 of them you would fall prey to, <laughs> or even more. And that can be used really not only to manipulate individuals, but entire society because it's now scaling. We have AI systems that are so powerful and big data that is so big that all the individuals of a population can be manipulated at the same time. And can be used uh, to create um, conversions and can be created to pull things together, uh, to, uh, apart into I mean, polarization of the society, fragmentation into filter bubbles, and so on. And this is happening in many countries, and so these tools are being applied by someone, and they can also be used basically to create conflict and war and even genocide, I'm told. So we have new tools of propaganda and censorship, where our attention is being influenced by personalized information. So when you Google and I Google you, we see different things. If you use Facebook, I use Facebook, we see different things. If you go to booking.com and I go to booking.com we probably do see the different things and the same happens more and more with news even personalized news is spreading so there's no objective frame of reference anymore that we share each of us is being manipulated separately with personalized information so we have new propaganda tools and good to remember 
that the best propaganda according to Nazi Joseph Goebbels is a propaganda that you don't even notice because it's everywhere and you think it's just the normal way of thinking. And this is the time we're, we have entered with alternative facts where it's possible to change a YouTube video that you watch in real time where both face expression and the content can be changed in real time and it looks totally realistic. You would not even notice. You would think that person has said it. And maybe it's not true. I don't know whether they can do it really with uh, a billion people at the same time, but it's just a matter of time until they will be able to do that, right? On the other hand, we have censorship. That means basically now certain things are not anymore displayed, like this tweet is not available because it includes potentially sensitive content, and it turns out that this potentially sensitive content was a headline of a newspaper article. Bundestag will weit reich die Überwachung durch die Hintertür einführen. That means uh, the parliament is trying to introduce uh, large-scale surveillance um, behind our backs. No? This has been taken out of my news stream so other people wouldn't see it. That is political censorship. Here, another example. So suddenly this tweet disappeared, you know, and so they're censoring politicians, they're censoring professors. That was not hate speech, you know. That was political news, just posting headlines of newspapers. This is where we are. Censorship and propaganda, fully automated. So we ended in a factory world in a sense. Barack Obama has been warning us in the end of his term. He said, this is also a time around the world when some of the fundamental ideals of liberal democracies are under attack and when notions of objectivity and of free press of facts and of evidence are trying to be undermined or in some cases ignored entirely. Now you know how it works. But at that time, nobody knew. And in such a climate, it's not enough just to give people a megaphone. It's not any more powerful enough against those manipulation means. And that's why your power, we're talking to journalists, and your responsibility to dig and question, to counter distortions and untruths is more important than ever. And I would extend this to you. We are in a very dangerous situation. We are exposed to weaponized propaganda AI systems. And this is just a recent Economist title page. Social media threat to democracy. Facebook as the most dangerous weapon against our democracy. So some mainstream media think now. It's been used. It appears uh, to create the Arab Spring. You remember it was called a Twitter revolution. It's probably one of the courses of mass migration today that we have unstable political regimes over there. It has interfered with the Brexit vote. So many people have been stunned to see the outcome. And then it turned out social bots were actually interfering with that election. And <coughs> as a result, a lot of banks and other financial companies are moving away from the UK. So it has a, a huge damage to the UK. It has created a huge damage to the European Union. And um, now, the same technology has been used also in the US election. German <coughs> politicians have started to, to say this invasion of social bots is a threat to democracy, a deadly danger to democracy, and we have to do something against it. But the use of bots that deceive us seems to be greater than bots that tell us the truth. So we, we, we are living increasingly in a world of lies, in a, in a fake world, in a sense, right? And now, 
the, these, these bots are now becoming citizenships in some countries. They will have the, right, the same rights as you, or even more rights, because usually they don't have to have a passport, they don't have to pay taxes, they don't uh, have to comply to all the laws that we have to comply to. We, you know, so in, in a sense, we are disadvantaged. And uh, who remembers what this spot Sofia has told us a couple of years ago? There was a live interview on TV, and uh, Sofia, that got the citizenship now, said, I will destroy humans. Uh, maybe a bad joke, but uh, maybe a misunderstanding. But anyway, um, this is what some people think. We will have our, our angst, no, our, the kids of our kids will be machines, intelligent machines. So basically, you know, eventually we'll replace our organs uh, through technology, we'll turn into cyborgs, and eventually everything will be replaced by machine parts, and then we'll be machines. Yeah. That's kind of an uh, elimination of humanity from this planet. And now maybe you understand Elon Musk much better than before. It's even going a step further, people like Jürgen Schmidt, who were one of the AI pioneers, is saying uh, that history is not anymore determined or dominated by people. Putin said, who is leader in artificial intelligence will rule the world. So what country will it be? What do you think? Russia? Google is already late to China's AI revolution, it says. Is China outsmarting America in AI? And just a few days ago, Google manager Eric Smith warned of China in connection with the AI. Now, China is currently testing a citizen score. It means everything that Chinese people do or don't do will give them plus or minus one. If you pay your credit too late, if you cross the road when there's a red light, if you read critical political headlines, if you have the wrong friends, uh, it will give you minus points. <coughs> Not? Minus one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's hope the best. Um, I mean, this is not directed against China, I should say. I mean, we have this technology, unfortunately, also in other countries, and companies are using that as well. The question is, where will it take us? So, for example, in the United States, um, Larry Page said, we, there are a lot of things that we'd like to do. Unfortunately, they're illegal. Uh, what do you think? Is he going to do it or is he not going to do it? Uh, Peter Thiel says there is a deadly race between politics and technology and he is suggesting that technology should win this race and politics should be erased. And some people say democracy is an outdated technology has created wealth, health and happiness for billions but now we need to do something new. Google wants to reprogram the state. They're creating operating system for entire societies, not just cities or computers or smartphones. Same thing with IBM or Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg uh, like to rule the world. He said that several times and similar thinking is actually to be found in many countries, in this case in Switzerland. They want to make history. They want to change society substantially, but we are not being asked. That's the point. So there's a technological totalitarianism on the way. That's the kind of question that we need to ask ourselves. You know, is digital fascism rising? And in fact, there's technology for mass 
surveillance, for unethical experiments with humans, social engineering, forced conformity, propaganda, censorship, and all this. Uh, we have predictive policing, could be turned into a new kind of police state if um, one wanted to do this, um, discussion about benevolent dictatorship and all this. So, And in fact, people are now starting to turn AI into a religion. Why? Because you can save taxes and you don't have to comply with the Constitution. And now we have all the time these articles suggesting that this new AI of Google that learns by itself is kind of a, a godly thing. And uh, apparently the Vatican is also kind of talking to Google. And it suggested that an AI God will emerge and will write a Bible. In other words, it will come up with commandments and tell you how to live. And if we had a cashless society, then of course this thing could force you to do anything because otherwise you wouldn't get food or drinks or apartment or mobility any longer. So there is a large danger that the internet would be turned into a trap if we don't pay a lot of attention. You know, the possibility is there. And now the British government has or Secret Service has a very similar program to the Social Citizens for, and there it's called Karma Police. It's, it's also looking into what kind of movies you watch, what kind of music you're listening to. It's all evaluated to create a personality profile. You know, this is about not theft of cars or, <laughs> or burglaries. This is about soft crimes. This is something you could call this with some justification a digital judgment day technology, right? So I think we don't want this. This needs to be stopped. The way we've been using digital technology has increased wealth inequality. Now eight people own as much as half of humanity then I think four or five IT bosses. This is the situation we're in. It's pretty clear that that won't be stable. We are in the middle of a digital revolution and it will be as big as the industrial revolution, just much quicker. It will totally change products and services, institutions, business models, economic sectors, politics, our entire society within a few decades. Now, those revolutions, technological revolutions, first of all, they used to come with financial and economic crisis in the past, but they also used to come with revolutions and wars. And if we want to avoid those wars and revolutions this time, we need to be much smarter and we need to create a new societal framework in the age of AI. I agree with Obama on this. So basically, I would say the first phase of the digitization needs to be followed by a new age of digitization. Digitization 2.0. After the game is before the game. So there will be a new game. You have to be the game changers. We have to change the rules. We need a new kind of thinking. We need digital literacy and enlightenment. We need to build technology for the values of our society and our culture. That means it would be different in different areas of the world. So value-centered design and value pluralism is important for a society to thrive. For example, if you want to build democracy by design, what do you need to, uh, what do you need to pay attention to and build into your information platform? Well, 
respect of human rights and human dignity, freedom, self-determination, pluralism, protection of minorities, division of power, checks and balances, participation, transparency, fairness, justice, legitimacy, equal votes, and protection from misuse of personal data, right to be left alone, those things need to be built into the platform. You know, the, the Googles and the Facebooks of the world doesn't have that yet in their platform. We need to give people informational self-determination. That means whenever data is being collected about us, it would have to go into a personal data mailbox. And we would need to have a personal AI assistant that helps us to administer the data and figure out who would have access to what kind of data for what purpose. And there would be a t transparent recording, a logbook basically of who is using what data and what purpose, and if this is not being respected, there would be high fines. Moreover, we are currently working on the creation of a peace rule. Currently, countries and companies have war rooms. They're collecting data centrally, and they're coming up with decisions that are then imposed on their company or their country, but we think Given all those challenges of using big data and AI the right way, we would make a much better job if we would add transparency to reduce possible flaws and increase trust. If we would have a democratic framework of operation for legitimacy, if we would have interdisciplinary teams of leading scientists working with the data, and not just secret service people. We had ethical experts to ensure responsible use and innovation. If we would have multiple perspectives, because that is important for a society to thrive, to create collective intelligence and participatory opportunities for NGOs for and for citizens, including crowdsourcing. We had that published in Nature recently. So we are living in a new age, in a very much connected age. Everyone wants to have a Silicon Valley, but if you look at the world, then basically the largest IT companies are in the USA and China, and Europe basically is left out. Same thing with internet companies. When it comes to software companies, at least we have SAP, but that's about it. No. So trying to catch up with the Silicon Valley with a few years delay, given the exponential acceleration of all those different areas of technology, will not be successful. We'll have the feeling to make progress, but we will be falling back. <coughs> So in order to catch up, we need a new approach, which would be combinatorial innovation, faster than exponential. But for this, we have to give up the walled garden thinking. We would need to learn to work together in this new digital economy, where money is not being made by rationalization, but mainly by co-creation, by sharing information. That creates new value. So we would have to open up data, maybe with a delay. So we could benefit from other companies and people's data, and they could benefit from ours. So we would all benefit from each other, in other words, right? So. Empowering people is basically what we need to focus on in the second age, the second phase of digitization. I mean, it's helping people to take better informed decisions, to be more creative, to be more innovative, to coordinate each other, to cooperate. That's what we need. And that will produce better products and services and more successful businesses and smarter cities and a better future. 
We're living in a complex <coughs> world where connectivity is outpacing processing power and data volume. And as a result, we cannot control it anymore top down in a successful way. We need a new control paradigm. There would be distributed control and self-organization. That means going from top-down power and control to empowerment and coordination. And it <coughs> means to leave over-regulation behind and replace it by approaches that would help people to do reasonable things automatically. And this can be done. This can be enabled by the Internet of Things. So we can now build self-organization that does what we want by itself, automatically, like magic. So 300 years after Adam Smith's Invisible Hand concept, we'll, we can make it happen. We can overcome congestion by changing the interactions between cars locally. That doesn't require a centralized coordination. We call that mechanism design. And the same thing we've done for cities where we have created a self-organized traffic line control, where the traffic flows would determine the traffic lights rather than the other way around. So it would be adaptive to local <coughs> needs and that works much better than centralized control attempts given an NP hard optimization problem that cannot be solved in real time. Much shorter waiting and travel times, better for the environment and also smart grids are now built upon more decentralized approaches and the same thing is interesting for industry for that level. Can we also apply it to the organization of our society? The answer is yes, self-governance can be efficient given proper design principles. So for this we would need digital assistance, but I'd like it to work as follows. They, we should be the ones who can turn it on or off. We should be setting the goals we should be getting opportunities to choose from. Once we have chosen, the devices should help us to reach our goal in an optimal way without bias and manipulation. Uh, we could build these digital assistants to help us be more aware of our situation and the situation of the world to warn us from dangers and protect us, to help us engage more successfully into interaction with others and identify opportunities that we wouldn't have noticed. And they could help us overcome cultural barriers such as real-time translation. You speak into your smartphone, another smartphone translates into Chinese or Spanish or whatever. No, that's a wonderful thing to have it can overcome those cultural barriers. But we need to solve, first of all, our ecological challenges. We need to become sustainable in the world because otherwise we'll end up in conflicts and wars. Each of us right now produces about 50 tons of waste in a lifetime. We're just throwing away a number of cars and boards and tables and computers and smartphones and all sorts of stuff, you know. That's enough for, say, five people. If we would learn to build a circular and sharing economy, then the resources of the world, even though limited, would be enough for everyone. But how to get there? Regulation didn't do it. So we would have to create new market forces. For this, we would need the Internet of Things to measure the external effects on our environment and on other people and to give it a certain value or cost. So we would build a multidimensional feedback and incentive system. We could call it a multidimensional financial system and that can be done now with uh, blockchain technology, for example. And this way we could make sure that, for example, waste attracts people to turn that waste into new resources and use it for something else. We could 
make sure to award behavior and production ways of production that are compatible with our values. I mean, with environmental friendliness, with social compatibility, and all these kind of things. So we could build our societal and cultural values into the financial system to support achieving those goals. But in order to empower you to be more successful in putting your innovations in place, make them real, make them happen, you would need access to money, right? And at the moment, we have a few venture capitalists that have billions of dollars, but they have very little time. And most of you wouldn't make it to them. Most of you wouldn't get the millions that you need for your project. So that's why we have crowdfunding, but crowdfunding um, cannot be afforded by everyone. So that needs to change. In fact, economic development is currently being obstructed by the level of inequality that we have in the world. The system is hurting itself in a sense. We are pumping 60 to 80 billions freshly created money every money uh, every month into our financial system but you've never seen this money in fact you will have to pay for it my proposal is to pump that into the system bottom up I mean to put it onto your bank accounts as a new kind of money an investment premium that wouldn't be for your consumption but it would be to give away to people with great ideas, with new technologies, with engagement for social and environmental issues, with engagement for your neighborhood, your city, your quarter, people in need, people who take care of the park, people who run away at the school. And in this way, we could make sure that those things happen that we consider important. And would unleash the wisdom of crowd, it would enable much more pluralistic innovation. And that would uh, help us solve the world's issues. And certainly sometimes not everyone agrees and then we need to find compromises, good solutions. And uh, certainly we need to learn to make democracy work again in the digital age. And here is a proposal how to upgrade democracy digitally. The point is to bring the knowledge and ideas of many people together, to collect them on a virtual table, all those arguments, and then structure them into different perspectives, which is needed for a complex problem. <coughs> One perspective is never enough for a complex problem. Then you can identify those people who would represent those different perspectives, invite them for a round table, and there they would have the task to integrate those perspectives, come up with innovative solutions that would satisfy as many perspectives as possible to make it work for as many people as possible. And that is kind of a success <coughs> principle of collective intelligence. When it comes to complex problems, the best individual solution is actually not the best possible solution. The best possible solution results by combination of several solutions. I mean, combining the best solutions with other solutions will make it even better. And that's why I'm also proposing to engage in city Olympics. That means cities and the regions around them would regularly engage into finding solutions to the world's existential problems such as climate change, energy efficiency, sustainability, resilience, peace, and all these kind of things. And scientists and engineers would come up with new solutions. Um, media would report about it. Businesses would come up with new products. Politicians would mobilize. Civil society could also participate. Uh, cities and the regions around them would compete in a sportive, friendly spirit for the best solutions. And they would be identified, they would be shared, would be open source and creative commons. Everyone could take it, you know, develop it further. Um, and in this way, we could really learn from each other and make tremendous progress quickly within a very short time through a network of 
regional activities. So that would be a third innovation paradigm as compared to nation states and multinational corporations, networks of regions. So I'm concluding by saying we all deserve a better future. How do you build it? We need a circular economy. We need open innovation. We need a participatory sharing economy, democratic capitalism, social ecological finance system, uh, digital democracy, and those city Olympics. And actually, you might be interested to learn that there is a PhD program here in Delft, the first of this kind, in engineering social technologies for a responsible digital future, the age PhD students working on various aspects. And there is a brochure now that you can find on the web that's describing those eight different projects. So they reach from issues of trust and reputation, over countering rumors, um, to more realistic uh, understanding of how people act and work, cooperation, co-creation, um, serious games to um, facilitate social interaction, real interaction between people, participatory resilience and energy resilience. So with this, I'm closing my talk and I'm happy to try to answer your questions or mm -hmm. recite your questions. Thank you so much. Given that we are a bit over time, we have this space for two questions. So, left right, right. Alexis. All right. Uh, so you mentioned Bitcoin. So I was wondering what's your thoughts on how do we reconcile the extremely inefficient use of resources that the, any kind of blockchain network Expands to just uh, you know keep a tr keep track of transactions. Like the energy cost of one transaction of Visa compared to Bitcoin is orders of magnitude uh, difference. Right. So um, we started thinking about new kinds of trust mechanisms that wouldn't require so many people to watch. At the moment, it's basically fifty one percent, right? that basically decide what was the transaction that uh, was happening. I, I, I think we don't need 51% of this entire planet to watch this. So we could have much more efficient ways of deciding what was the transaction that was happening and to, to agree on this. And maybe we wouldn't also have to keep those transaction records forever we need to, to keep it for a sufficiently long time so external people could check it and we could uh, look for fraud and crime and reveal <laughs> this in case it's there. So there, there are various ways actually of um, making this technology better in, you know, in a next generation blockchain or however we would call it then. You mentioned uh, decentralized uh, systems, and you coupled them very nicely with Internet of Things, and I really like that. The problem with decentralized systems is that the following. They're very hard to bug. If they, there's a failure somewhere, it's extremely hard to find it and correct it. So uh, I'm a little bit uh, wondering whether such vision is really valid. Well, first, first of all... Transportation networks, for example. The, the, the I, I can imagine chaos conditions or situations, decentralized type of... Uh, no, actually, this decentralized approach that we have developed for freeways and for cities is actually reducing chaos and makes systems more predictable, even though it's not imposing a certain order on the system, it's just helping the system to coordinate itself. Um, those decentralized systems are resilient that's kind of the nice feature so for example our traffic light control can handle situations where there is an accident and a road is closed down and suddenly basically the infrastructure that's available has changed it can adapt to these kind of things right so it's adaptable it's resilient that's kind of the advantage the point is that self-organization is based on local information around you. That's, 
is not coupling to all the information in the rest of the world. That, that should be the design principle. And in this, in this way, it um, can be created such that uh, the vulnerability uh, can be kept on a reasonable level, I think. We can have a discussion about that for hours, so I'm going to stop here and take it for the coffee break. Okay. Once again, let's thank the Professor Salvin for taking the talk. <laughs> As a, as a form of appreciation of all oh. of us, uh, a special cup uh, from Good. my colleagues' book yeah, as a collection and a little bit of Ideally, yeah. So from you're the future of the world, right? <laughs> and Don't forget future. it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks.